So before we get started, I want you all to think about the best neighbor you've ever had. The best neighbor I've ever had is this guy named Jim. He lives two doors down the hall, and I never see him. But whenever there's a problem in our building, I always see Jim. He's on the phone with the fire department after a false alarm. He's fi posting instructions on how to fix the garage door. He's picking up litter on the sidewalk. And earlier this summer, when I was stuck in our building's elevator for over an hour, Jim was the person who helped me escape. This is a picture of me and my daughter short, just moments after I got out of the elevator. Jim isn't pictured here because he's inside the elevator with the repairman. When I think of empathetic companies in the community, I compare them to the best neighbors I've ever had, just like Jim. They have a good grasp on your perspective, they're service-oriented, and they partner with others um, to make change for the better. Today, I want to share a few stories with you as we go over steps to getting started with empathetic work in the community. Increasingly, employees demand this kind of engagement, but also increasingly, your company has the opportunity to benefit from it. Let's get right started. The first step is, sounds counterintuitive, but it's to really know who you are. I don't mean knowing your industry. I mean having a clear example of what your core values are. Um, so for example, if your company makes furniture, furniture probably isn't one of your core values. It's just the thing you happen to make. It sounds simple, but I see this in the tech industry all the time. Technology is mistaken for a core value. On the other hand, American Express has been leading with their values for decades now. Though admittedly, when I first learned about their commitment to historic preservation, I wasn't sure how that connected to the card in my wallet. But American Express realized in the 80s, I think, um, that um, they realized in the 80s that they were really the world's largest travel company. They're, they have a commitment to integrity, quality, and a commitment to the, to the customer. Not just customer service, but customer commitment. Suddenly, by looking at the values level, it makes sense that American Express would want to preserve one, some of the world's most enduring, uh, enduring cultural artifacts. I work at a company like MailChimp, called MailChimp. We're an email marketing company, and we don't consider the words email or marketing in our, when we express our brand in the community. Instead, we look to our three core values, humility, creativity, and independence. They guide and frame our behavior. I learned quickly that outside the walls of our offices, it's important to lead with who you are and not what you know. While we each have a valuable perspective or significant expertise, we also start out knowing very little within the context of community. And that's OK, because your partners will be the experts. Plus, you'll already be ahead of most large, sophisticated corporate social responsibility programs. Most CSR programs started with mandated compliance or the niche interests of an executive. And many of the CSR practitioners that I talk to um, wish they could start over and lead strategically with their values. US companies often approach their community partners with what they know, and it leads to this sort of condescending perspective. Uh, it, it, they don't have much respect for the value of the work of the organizations, since they themselves are already the experts. And they feel their partners do good, but they're skeptical that they're professional. On the left here is a list of words that describe a typical approach. On the right is an empathetic approach. I got started with CSR in a way I didn't really expect. When I was fairly new to MailChimp, um, our, C our CEO, Ben Chestnut, who had this air of mystery about him, uh, he emailed me out of the blue and said, please step into my office. Things weren't looking good. I thought that he was surely about to fire me for secret CEO reasons. But instead, he sat me down, and he said he was really, really annoyed. He was annoyed at the fact that startup tech founders were talking about the words community. What they meant by that, he explained, uh, was the importance of the tech startup ecosystem, an exclusive definition of the word community. Ben asked me to define what community meant for MailChimp. He didn't know what MailChimp, MailChimp's community should be, and although Ben is a very generous person, this didn't come from an altruistic perspective. He was just annoyed. And in fact, I don't think that your corporate citizenship or your CSR should be left to, um, it doesn't have to come from the do-gooder in your office who wants to change the world. It doesn't have to be, uh, come from a place of selflessness or charity. And it probably shouldn't even be nice, charitable, or compliant at its base. Instead, I like to see strategies, CSR that's strategic, inclusive, and joyful. 
Many of the entrepreneurs around us were choosing an exclusive definition of community. We strategically chose to be inclusive and to distinguish our work by empowering the underdogs around us. And we've had a lot of fun doing it. The next step is to find organizations with shared values. That means stepping outside your office, rolling up your sleeves, and getting curious about the world, kind of like what we're doing this week. The other day, I read this interview with the filmmaker Werner Herzog. He was talking about, among other things, Pokemon Go. And I love this quote. I wish everybody would come out of nowhere and be self-taught by life itself, by the world itself. Especially in a young field like CSR, there's a lot of room for creativity. Please resist the urge to seek out best practices or white papers to teach you how to be good or empathetic. Instead, consider taking a look at the people already making an impact around you. I tend to get inspiration from outside of CSR. One of my favorite recent projects is a marketing partnership from the clothing company Carhartt. Carhartt makes durable workwear for people in working class professions, folks who make things with their hands and make a living with their hands. Carhartt partnered with New Holland Brewing Company to make a new beer that celebrates craft beer. Craft beer in the United States is sometimes perceived as a little too snooty, and a down-to-earth brand on the surface uh, probably shouldn't have anything to do with a snooty craft beer. But on the values level, Carhartt recognized that the people making the beer um, who were passionate about making something by hand really aligned with their perspective. So by making this beer together and celebrating the values of Carhartt and, cra and the brewers behind craft beer, they were able to celebrate the beer, the clothing, the act of creation, and American working class values. MailChimp is a company in Atlanta, and we are um, dedicated to, to democratizing enterprise software. I feel, I feel very akin to public transportation. We have a metro system in Atlanta that democratizes transportation for everyone. We both make things accessible, and we both try to make things a little bit joyful. We thought that our humble metro system could use just a little bit more joy, however. So we partnered with the people behind We Love ATL. They're a loose organization of civically-minded photographers. Our project to inject joy was to turn met our metro's busiest station into an art gallery for two months. So we removed 65 different advertisements and replaced them with the work of 500 photographers who had already captured on their phones different aspects of our city. The artists were everyday people, often the same people who were already waiting on the train. And their work was now being shown in one of the most accessible places possible, often by surprise. Waiting on the train became just a little bit more joyful. Our idea wasn't new. It just combined the work and the values of We Love ATL and our metro. Our role was to identify shared values and make it easy for our partners to do what they do best. The next step is asking how you can help. One of the most impactful TED Talks I've heard is by the writer Chimamanda Adichie. It's called The Danger of a Single Story, and this quote sums it up. Power is the ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person. These words apply to pretty much any power dynamic. And a company who chooses to work in the community wields tremendous power by default. Acknowledging your power is critically important, and asking how you can help can he keep your power in check. It'll also help you empathize and help your partner organization succeed. And finally, it'll help you clarify your objectives. I tend to see three problems that companies like to address through CSR, organizational, technical, and political problems. So much of the CSR, I notice, is an organizational problem, an attempt to solve a problem within the company and using the outside world to do it. If what you want to do is get your employees to volunteer and build their their effort as a team, that's fine. But it's not empathetic, and it's, not, it's about you. Technical problems are ones that companies are most likely to be able to help. This is, say, building a nonprofit's website or providing food to the hungry. But political problems are the ones that are most intractable, and unfortunately, we see companies trying to address these with technical solutions all the time. Tech companies, in particular, are great at addressing political problems with technical solutions. Last month, the ride-sharing company Uber waded into the movement for black lives. During a particularly violent week, Uber released a feature in their app that swapped their car icon for a peace icon. They suggested that their customers take a moment to reflect on gun violence. 
Uber probably isn't the most empathetic company, and I can see due to their aggressive business practices why they would want to be perceived as so. But the movement for black lives is a, a, prob a, a deeply political problem uh, fueled by years of systemic racism. Uh, changing an icon in an app is not going to change anything. And while I'm sure Uber was being nice or thought they were being charitable or helpful, what they were really doing is providing a technical solution that nobody asked for. Good intentions are not enough, and being nice isn't nearly good enough. A year after I was asked to define community, our CEO, Ben, emailed me. Do you all remember Ben? He's still, still mysterious at this point. He sent a picture of a bike fix-it stand in Boston and asked if they would be useful to have in Atlanta. Fix-it stands provide tools for cyclists to get, fix their bikes when they're away from home. They're not glamorous. They just make getting to and from work a little bit better. It would have been easy for us to buy a bunch of these for our city and pay someone to install them. But instead, we decided to ask our partners and experts and advocates at the Atlanta Bicycle Coalition what they thought of bike fix-it stands. And in fact, they were thinking about uh, buying several for our metro stations across the city. A few months later, they would kicked off a crowdfunding campaign which MailChimp matched dollar for dollar. A pilot program of seven fix-it stands at different metro stations emerged a year later. And just last month, our, the Atlanta Bicycle Coalition announced that they'd be installing a fix-it stand at each of our metro's 38 stations. Um, this is something that we could have done kind of in a condescending way by purchasing these, but instead, just by asking how we can help, um, we got a much more satisfying result, and we spent a lot less money. That's why our involvement with each project looks a little bit different. Each year, we work with more than 60 small and medium-sized organizations and respond to the needs of each one. Sometimes we quietly elevate the work of our partners, and other times we show up to shout our support from the street. The last step is profit. Our company is a little bit different in that we don't have investors in the traditional sense. We're bootstrapped. Instead, we invest in the community on behalf of our employees. By putting MailChimp's money to work for, on their behalf, my hope is that we can help cultivate a sense of belonging. We've put together a humble effort to make our city just a little bit better, weirder, and more human. Earlier this year, we released our first ever investor report that outlines our values, highlights our partners, and documents our work. As a part of a larger anonymous survey, we asked our employees to rate how important it is for MailChimp to be a good corporate citizen. Here are a few of their responses. I'm proud of what MailChimp does for the community and what we stand for. It gives me an additional, it gives me a way to feel additional ownership in what we do and why we do it. I have such pride in working for a company that wants to give back to Atlanta. It instills loyalty beyond imagination. I'll leave you with this thought from the cultural activist Roberta, Roberta Bedoya. Although here he's critiquing creative placemaking, I feel like he's imploring me, imploring you, and imploring each of our neighbors to carve out a space together where we can all belong. Thank you. <laughs>